2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start verse 11. Uh, we're going to go to uh, verse 26. If you can, please just uh, be mindful of what we're reading. Uh, we will be going through a uh, majority of it. Um, very loaded uh, passage of Scripture. The whole epistles, everything's loaded. But, uh, starting verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shame profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Their word will eat, will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hamanias and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrown the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and of some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also useful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preventure will give them into repentance to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have taken uh, captive by him at his will. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that there's a record in heaven. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the time you've given us. Thank you for the good singing. Father, thank you for the change in life that only you can bring. Father, we pray that you bless this, this night. Bless your word. Bless the reading, the minds, the ears to receive. Father, bless the hearts to receive. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So like, that's exactly what uh, I want to preach on tonight is he knows my name. My name. The song goes this. He counts the stars one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shores. He sees every sparrow that falls. He made the mountains and the seas. He's in control of everything. Of all creatures great and small. And he knows my name. Every step that I take. Every move that I make. Every tear that I cry. He knows my name. When I'm overwhelmed by the pain. And can't see the light of day. I know I'll be just fine. Because he knows my name. He knows my name because he loves me. He knows my name because 2,000 years ago of Calvary. Calvary Hill still gives me a thrill. You can't comprehend that until you get saved. Born again. I want to emphasize tonight. That the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, knows my name. I want you to know salvation comes from only one name. And that name is a name which is above every name. Salvation in the path of heaven does not go through Buddha. It don't go through the Pope. It don't go through the perverted Dalai Lama. And it for sure don't go through Muhammad. But it comes through the one name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. It goes through the King of the Jews. It goes through the Lamb of God. His name is Jesus. The Lord Jesus to be specific. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my best friend. He's called many things in your Bible. These names are not just for His authority and for His title. These names have a specific meaning to help you. The shield, the rock, the buckler, the way, the truth, the life, the good shepherd, the beginning and end, the Alpha Omega, Emmanuel, the light, the word, the, the bread of life, the redeemer, the lamb of God, the only begotten, the bread of life, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the savior. Bless my soul, he's the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. He's the creator of the universe, and he knows me, and I know him personally. How personal is that? Well, according to my Bible, it says he committed his love toward Cody, and that while he was yet a sinner, Christ died for him. John 3.16 says, for God so loved Cody that he gave his only begotten son so that Cody may believe in him but not perish but have everlasting life. We all know that verse says world. He died for the world. He is the propitiations for the world. 
But he loves you so much that if you were the only one, he still would have went to the cross. When it comes to your salvation, when it comes to your appointment for judgment, you need to treat it as you are the only one in the world. I'm not bragging on myself, but you must work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. It is a relationship that the Lord Jesus Christ wants from you. Your name is very special. It's who we are. It's a start to a friendship. It's a, it's a start to an introduction. Many of us are named by past relatives, past people that have had a major impact on our life. Some after celebrities, some after movie stars. My name will never appear on an NFL roster. It will never appear on an NBA roster. My name will never be on a board of a 500, Fortune 500. It will never headline the Yum Center, the, the Rupp Arena, or Madison Square Garden. To your surprise, you will not find my name on t-shirts, billboards, or the television. There will never be thousands in unison screaming my name. There will be no nationwide mourning for me when I die. You see, my, this, my name to this world means nothing. But to the Lord Jesus Christ, He holds it near and dear to Him. You, you see, I, I've never made a fortune, Brother Brian. And it's probably too late now. But can I just thank the Lord and say that I don't have to worry about that much. Because I'm happy anyhow. I'm shouting happy. Because my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I get a little excited that there's an infallible record in heaven. And, and my name has been added to that list. And that's not it. As I go along life's journey, I'm reaping better than I've sown. I, I'll be honest to tell you, I don't got a lot of riches. Sometimes the going's rough. But I have a friend in Jesus. And can I tell you tonight, your, your, your name might not mean much to anyone. It may be on a parole board. It might be on a jail record. It may be on a divorce letter. It may come out of somebody's mouth in a derogatory manner. But the Bible says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. There is unspeakable joy in heaven when your name is written down. There is joy when you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your, may, your name might actually have some significance to this world. Your, your name might mean something. But the, the Bible says there is no respecter of persons with God. Getting saved, born again, having your name written in heaven gives you a brand a new identity. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's the will of God of all of mankind to be a new creature in Christ and have heaven as our destiny when we die. We all have different callings once we get saved to God and to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus said himself, John 6 40, and this is the will of him that sent me that everyone that seeth the son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at that last day. God is personal and God wants you to get personal with him. Your soul is valuable. It must go somewhere. The devil does all he can to pursue it and the Lord Jesus Christ laid his life down for it. Your soul is valuable to him that he sent himself. The creator sent into his creation to be born of the creature. He was sent as a baby, given a name, and she shall bring forth a, a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Uh, we always get, well, I got my favorite scripture, it's my favorite scripture, well, it's a cliche, but my favorite scripture in the entire Bible is John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the Father, we beheld his glory, glory of the, the, the glory of the, of the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and full of truth. The Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word. He came flesh with us. God was manifest in the flesh like us. He put Himself under His own subjection of His own law. The Lord Jesus is a high priest that understands your burden, understands your temptations, understands your worry. He's been there, done that. You study these other, other gods and other false religions, you'll see Christianity is the only way where God wouldn't make you or tell you to do something that He hasn't done for Himself. It's not works like all others. It's by grace through faith are you saved. True, unweathering faith. He knows my name. But listen, you just knowing God isn't what gets you saved. It's God knowing you. And through our text, I will do my best to make it make sense. God knowing you. He knows your disabilities, your deformities, your fear, your failures, your sorrow, your sicknesses, your pain, your problems and persecutions. He knows your heart, your hardship. That's what makes grace much more amazing. He loves you so much that he'll take care of you, clean you up, and use you for his glory. Yeah. So tonight, the Lord and I, well, uh, this is more of a teaching, more of a Bible study message. But I pray you pay, you pay good attention. I uh, uh, pray that we glean something from it. Yeah. So in our text, uh, 2 Timothy, it's a, it's a second letter. It's written by the Apostle Paul to a young pastor. It's a young preacher by the name of Timothy. Yeah. Um, these two letters, 1 and 2 Timothy, is what I would call your pastoral epistles. Yeah. You, you want to know how you're... The conduct and your character that your pastor should be acting. 
First uh, and Second Timothy is for you. If you're a man of God that is called to preach, First and Second Timothy is for you. If you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, First and Second Timothy is for you. The warnings and the cautions he speaks of are so true. They're so mind-blowing with the times that we live in. It's without a doubt that the scripture was written by God. This would be the final letter uh, Paul would be writing. Uh, he was ultimately beheaded for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of preachers, I've heard it put, uh, this is his last will and his last testament. This is his obituary. So in common theme with Paul, Paul never held back. Apostle Paul, so Paul was a man of God that told you how it was. Biblical records show Paul was arrested three times. And he knew that this stretch would be his last one. Execution inedible, inedible, his clock ticking on his life. In this letter, you still will not find a single complaint. You will not find an apology for anything he's done. And you will not find an explanation for everything that he has done in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. When Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he meant it. Problem today, people are too embarrassed. Or care too much about a self-image or approval from society. Too puffed up on self-accolades. Too worried about the crowd inside the church instead of the ones outside that actually need us. I want to solely focus on that, that verse 19. It says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So I tell you, it sounds all cute. It sounds great. He, he knows my name. Of course he knows your name. He knows everything. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. But I want to look at, are you displaying that you belong to him? Is your mindset and your heart certain that your name is written in heaven? We're aware that he's omnipotent. He, I, I, I want to look at things that these are things that we forsake. Sometimes we need a, a little reminder that God is evaluating, uh, evaluating us on some things. Either we slack or we just need a reminder. He knows who are his. Like we said here, the master knows the ones ready for use. Your use, your stewardship, your servanthood. You can be saved and do nothing. And tonight I'm going to be just as bold as Paul. You should be ashamed of yourself. It, 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 it's not to a degree of, of shoving it down your throat or, or being harsh. It's sometimes maybe you listen to the wrong people. Like the, the people in our text. Maybe your Bible reading isn't what it should be. We're not, all called to, we're not all called to dissect verses. Smooth talkers, vain babblings sound better than reading. Truth becomes distorted when there's no effort on your end. So with this passage... We mistake it as a behavior or a conduct issue. The idea of chapter 2 is exactly that. It is conduct and it is behavior. Doesn't make sense. It will. What we have is a warning from God Almighty Himself. And I always try to say, context, context, context. You want to understand your Bible, you need the context, the customs, and the cultures of the time. Or you will not understand it. There is consequence when the wrong doctrine is taught. There is consequence to unfaithful workmanship and unfaithful stewardship. This is a letter to, the, to a man of God that is in charge of fleeting, feeding the flock. Doctrine is so important. Doctrine. Doctrine is the teaching. It is the learning of the Lord Jesus Christ and his instruction and his commandments. Paul wrote, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can sit and you can do nothing. God is not just going to put information inside of your brain. Yeah. There is a weird thing going around on social media where you, that you sit there and you download information and then they have a prophetic message for you. That is hogwash and it's not true. There is an individual responsibility for your faith. There has to be effort. A lot don't like hearing it. If you don't desire your Bible, if you don't desire your preaching, you need to reevaluate your heart. Yeah. Ain't that doubt in our salvation? No, I don't want you to go to hell. I want to make sure that you understand that your name is written in heaven. Why does doctrine matter so much? Remember, keep in mind everything that we've just read. Your doctrine. Doctrine is the foundation of God. The foundation of God is truth. The doctrine you teach, and if you're not reading, the doctrine you sit under and feed on becomes your foundation. And I'll go as far as say there's only one doctrine. There's one word. There's one truth. There's one real Bible. Amen. And the story to that. Foundation is not how you act. You can be the nicest person in the world, still have a terrible foundation that leads to being weak in the faith, weak in the faith according to the scriptures. The Lord knows your name and he knows your foundation. The foundation is the truth. It's the faith that Paul talked about. They're all linked together. There's bad behavior in Christian community because of bad, silly doctrine. There's disobedient servants because of a weak, a weak crippled, compromised foundation. Preacher, why does that matter? Those people believe they got the gospel. 
Corrupt teachers makes the foundation of God hidden to those that don't know the foundation of God. This foundation was freely given to us at a great cost. It cost the Lord Jesus Christ his life. This book that I hold in my hand has passed through the hands of martyrs that were burned at the stake. They were sold in half and crucified upside down. And I'm talking real, real martyrs. This crap we had in 2020, that's not martyr. The protest for a, a, an Xbox, that's not martyr. That's criminal activity. The foundation of God, the teaching of God deserves reverence. Paul called the church the pillar and the ground of truth. Not because of the people, but because of the truth that was given to the church. <clears throat> so when a man of God stands behind a pulpit and warns against false teaching, I'm not declaring that I know it all, because I don't. I have a Bible. But I know for a fact, according to the scriptures, that there is stuff being taught that can be dangerous to somebody. According to the scriptures. I will never give you an a, a opinion that's outside of the scriptures up here. Here's some doctrine. There is doctrine that says you can live like hell, die and go to heaven. That you can be saved and still love and desire the world. 1 John 2, 5 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There is a damnable, silly doctrine called purgatory. 1 Thessalonians 1, 8 says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not, the, know not God, that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Purgatory is you die and the priest can, you, your family members can pay the priest and you get prayed out of hell. That's nonsense. The same ones teach you that you're incapable of getting a prayer to heaven, so you need to go into a box and speak to a man and give him your confession. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between men and God, the man Christ Jesus. That's why he died. He put us back together, the ministry of reconciliation. There's a doctrine that says you can lose your salvation. Jesus himself said you're in my hand, and he's in the Father's hands. Can't no man pluck you out. That would frustrate the grace of God and make God a liar. If that were true, I wouldn't want to stand up here and preach about somebody that would forsake you over making a mistake. Some teach that God is not a trinity and that Jesus is a created being. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And those three are one. I just said it. In the beginning was the Word, Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jehovah's Witnesses, they have that the Word was a God. That's a created being. That's a damnable heresy. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's been in communion since the beginning of time. There's doctrine that say tongues are evidence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. He didn't say, except you speak in a language, you have no idea what you're saying, you shall likewise perish. I believe in tongues as long as it's English. Repentance is the only evidence of salvation. I have seen people, a lot of people that rubs the wrong way. I don't care, it's what Bible is. The, can you, somebody go into it, I've seen testimony videos where these people have, were desiring God so much. They went into a church. They seemed to speak in tongues. They, they said, well, I, I, can't, I can't get it. I can't do it. The Holy Spirit, I can't get saved. Fortunately, they go to a church that they, they, teach, they teach the right thing. That's not evidence. That's a damnable heresy. You can send somebody to hell off that. Yep. Yep. While we're on that one, modern day prophets, they're not telling you nothing that came from God. I don't need a message from God. If God's going to tell me something, he's going to tell me personally. If I need something from God, I'll open up my Bible and he's already got it for me. Jesus was the express image of his person. Jesus was the final prophet. And this book is the final prophecy that we need. The Bible says prophecy shall fail and tongues shall cease. Modern day apostles. 2 Corinthians 12 tell truly the signs of an apostle were, were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. That says were among you. Apostleship is not seniority. Just because you got gray hair and you got experience in the church does not make you some type of apostle. The apostle Paul said, he even said he was born uh, out of due season and he saw the resurrected Christ. Nobody today has seen the resurrected Christ. There is no such thing as modern day apostles. Stay away from somebody that needs a title. There's a doctrine. I'll lump this one all together. Culture. The devil has an absolute stronghold on culture. The modern day church is doing their best. That when culture moves forward, they've got to step back in their place. There's even churches that try to get out and hit of, uh, of the world trying to get them in. And that's not, how we're supposed, that's not how we're supposed to win them in. We're supposed to be different from the world. Yeah. What, are, what are these culture doctrine? Homosexual pastors. Yeah. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as a woman. Mankind is an abomination to yeah. the Lord thy God. Pro-choice pastors. No such thing in my, in my opinion. But we have one that's a senator in our Congress. A woman leading worship and behind the pulpit. 
Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Yeah. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to assert authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Yeah. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity with holiness, with sobriety. In a public setting, a man is in charge. A man leads the preaching, he leads the singing, he leads the praying. That is Bible. You go even a step further, 1 Corinthians 14, it says that your women should learn in silence because that's the, that's the household. If you want to learn anything, you go, you go home and you learn under your husband. Amen. Those last three, they're all culture. They are a direct attack on family, God's intentions for the home. If the man was the head of the house, what makes him, why is he not head of the house, uh, head of the church? That's contradictive of itself. I don't think that people really understand of the attack people have, that, that, that Satan has on Family right now. Family is an important part of your spiritual foundation. If you look at our libraries, look at our, our, our schools, they're, they're chan there's a chant they said, we're here, we're queer, we're coming for your children. Homosexual and women leading worship. Everything I just listened. Holy Spirit will never, ever, and I say ever, will never work in contradiction with this book. God is not woke and he will never, ever go woke. These are, these are just some of the pot. There are some doozies out there. There's some people who think God's a woman. They think Lucifer is Jesus' uh, brother. There are some doozies that I don't know how they get this out of here. And it, read it. We're, we're, <laughs> it's simple as reading your Bible. You don't know like these people like Jim Jones. They get these people down there and they drink this Kool-Aid and you see these cults. I don't say they deserve it, but my goodness, read your Bible. So on this issue, people get deceived. You don't read your Bible, you don't understand Build their beliefs on something that is not true. If their belief is not true, you're not standing on the foundation of God. Our faith, what we believe or we don't believe, doesn't determine the truth of God. Yeah. Believe what you want. It doesn't matter. He laid the foundation and gave it to us in the volume of a book. A motivational speaker can get up. He can get up in your feelings and make you think grace and the world allows it. Then you act on it, but you don't know better. The result of that is verse 18, which leads to your faith being overthrown. And falsely, false hope is false faith. And that's dangerous. Yes. A lot of times we don't, we don't like naming names up here. But Paul, Paul did it plenty of times. Oh, Called them out name for name. Paul at the hammer day is very quick to let you know who to avoid. Yeah. Who, who is beneficial to you. Yes, you are to stay away from particular people. Yeah. You are told to mark people. There are costly. And I tell you from experience. There is costly error hanging around the wrong people. Yeah. Not just the world. That should be obvious. But I got thinking hard on this. It says, be not equally loved with, uh, with the unbelievers. What fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light and darkness? You can't handle it. And what I mean by that, when you're walking in the spirit and you got to be around somebody for eight, ten hours that are constantly carnal or they don't want to help you, they don't care about your faith, they don't do nothing, it's going to wear you down. Hard. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It is a, or you've got to know what you're doing. I tell you what, I've made mistakes by hanging around the wrong people. Sure. And I tell you what, it, it, it'll drive you nuts. Yeah. You'll live a life of chastisement. You'll, you'll either you'll live a life of misery or you'll fall into it. And you'll just blend in with them. But in the context, Paul's talking about people within the church. Bad teaching and secular conversation. So verses 17 and 18. And the word will eat and doth a canker of whom is Hamanias and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And overthrown the faith of some. Erred from the truth. If that ain't pastors or preachers in 2023, I don't know what it is. This explains false doctrines. First Timothy, he said, some would depart from the faith. Depart from the faith. The truth. The foundation. They give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There are men that will leave a fundamental, independent Baptist church. And will absolutely demolish the foundation that they sat under. And they will hide it from those that don't know no better. Why fundamental independent Baptist? It, it's not a, people think that's a cult. A cult, the thing about a cult, you can't leave. If you ever want to leave, you can gladly get up and leave and not come back. Fundamental, it's the Bible. We're independent. We're not associated with some liberal <coughs> convention. And we're Baptist. The blood, the book, the blessed hope. That is, yeah. That's a, that's pretty simple as it gets. Yeah. Contemporary is scary. And not just, and I don't mean that as a jealousy scary, but the deception that is going on in the contemporary movement. Why do they depart? Well, it's filthy lucre. It's itching ears. It's too much dialogue with the devil. 
how do we combat this? How do, how do we stand against it? Earlier he, in this uh, chapter, he says that we're soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we acknowledge right and wrong? It's not bearing witness with each other. That verse is taken so far out of context, it's unreal. He said it's a spirit of adoption where it's where his spirit, uh, we, we bear witness with his spirit. The capital S but lowercase s. If somebody's up in, up in your business telling you you're living wrong, you're not going to bear witness with them. That's, we're, we're too judgmental. We bear witness with the Father. If your pastor is based off who you bear witness with, who says it right, that is a no-no. That, that will lead you to an unsafe foundation. Once we're saved, regardless of foundation, wherever you are, who you are is witness to. If there's a presentation of the gospel, you can get saved, but you can't grow. How do you build your foundation? You read your Bible. Yes. Study, uh, in uh, verse 15, he said, study. Study, study, study to show thyself approved unto God. Approved unto who? Approved unto God. As you can say, he knows your focus on that. So without reading your word, you won't even be able to distinguish wrong doctrine and wrong teachers. There are doctrines that people don't even realize is against God. That's why there's strife. That's why there's hypocrisy within the church. Difference of opinion versus what thus saith the Lord thy God. Have you under wondered why you lose your mind when hell breaks loose? You ever wondered why you're so jittery or so worried or so stressed? Jesus spoke of that in Matthew 7. Listen, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Do them or do them not. You, you don't know uh, what to do unless you read them. Stop watching Facebook and watching YouTube and doing what, what, what they say. Luke 6.46, Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Faith is a free will choice. Obey or not. Foundation is, there's more to just your truth. There's prayer, there's fasting, there's study, there's reading. If you don't want it, you don't, you don't have to do it. You're saved. God's not a liar. He still loves you, but you're just missing out on the intimacy that, that was intended for you. Paul calls arguments and debates and false doctrine a canker. It's giving undeserved attention to distracting arguments. One of the best tools of the devil is distraction. And it spreads like when a canker is left untreated. It spreads to the rest of the body. It causes pain. It causes damage. When ideas don't line up within the church, it divides the body of Christ, causes the body not to be at full strength. Right. Brother Cody, you're doing exactly what you're preaching against. No, I'm not. If you read 25, 26, he says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Yeah. They know they're wrong. Yeah. If God pre yourself, so if God perhaps will give them repentance to the knowledge of truth, if they, if they snap out of it and they understand the truth, and that they recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, it's the devil that's got them lied, that's got them deceived. It's a doctrine of devils. Who have taken captive by him at his will. We always say, please tell me if I'm wrong. But then we don't like the answer. The problem is we stand back and we watch too much. Whether they, we, they want to accept it or not. But nevertheless, nevertheless, everything we read, Paul said, you can do this. You can do this. This can happen. That can happen. But nevertheless, no matter what is taught, how delusional this world will get. The foundation of God standeth sure. The foundation of God will never change as much as culture wants it to. Verse 19 again. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Lord knows who are his, not the people. It's iniquity to wrongly divide the word of truth and deceive others. James 3 it says, Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Masters being teachers. So back to 7. In its context, he speaks of a worker of iniquity. Verse 15 of Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. There he lists their fruits. Your fruit is their action, their conduct, and their character. And a fruit starts out as a seed. So it starts small and then it festers out and that's what you see. We don't see the heart and we don't see the mind. We see action. Paul said, uh, I beseech you, brethren, therefore by the mercy of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy sacrifice, God, which is your reasonable service. Your body is the outside appearance. Your outside appearance does mean something. If you read the word and you divide it right, you'll see fruit. You'll see what's good. You'll see what's corruptible. You say, preacher, that's judging. 
Well, you got that absolutely right. Why did Jesus give this word? In this Bible, the Bible calls itself, it calls itself the discerner. A discerner is right from wrong. How do you know right from wrong? You read your Bible. You look at something and say, yep, that's unbiblical. Yep, that don't line up with it. Judge ye righteous judgment. If you're living right, you're living clean. You can judge a righteous judgment. Amen. Amen. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart me, ye that work iniquity. That's teachers, that's preachers, that's pastors. Your pastor is very very important. You have got, we have got great pastors at yeah. Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. Yeah. Very faithful, faithful pastors. I thank God for my pastors. Yeah. You can never have too much Jesus, but you can't have too many teachers. And you can't have too many pa pastors. Watch what you're doing. Yeah. <coughs> so verse 20 of our text. Uh, uh, I wanted to hit, I wanted to be a point. Uh, but just real quick. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of, if you want to read along verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. The word vessel here means a container, where of self or where a vessel of this body, but in the context, he means a household container. It's a, he means a plate or a dish or some type of bowl. The master of the house has certain vessels that are honorable because they're sanctified. They are used for a good purpose. He also has vessels that are dishonorable. The honorable plates and containers are the ones that are gold and silver. The ones that are dishonorable are wood and they're clay and they're fragile. They break easy under pressure. Uh, they're, they're garbage pails. It's what you take the garbage out in. The, the honorable ones are what you serve the food, the food on. It's a picture of the church. The Lord Jesus Christ is a picture of the master. Some are worthy to be brought out in public. They have value. They're clean. They're reliable. They serve their purpose the correct way. They are what you want the, your bread of life served on. The, the men of God that are, that are learning the word and actually want to help you. That's who you want in public. Uh, you want your guest to see the most beautiful. You never want them to see the garbage. But that's how it is. You must have both. That's just the congregation. That's just how we are. We're, we're imperfect. You will have both. So in verse 21, what's the uh, honorable, ver uh, honorable vessel? It's sanctified and it's employed by the master and it's prepared Past tense, it's already been sanctified. Already, past tense, sanctified. So it's set apart. It's different from the dirty ones. Different from the fragile ones. Something you've got to understand. The ministry is not the place for a man to work on his sanctification. He's got to be sanctified before he gets into the ministry. Lives are at stake. Souls are at stake. A person is not a vessel of honor until they have been separated from sin and they are striving for holiness. They are meek for the master's use. They have been submissive to the master. They have proven themselves before the master. Some men are sanctified and want to do the will of God. They want to save souls. They want to change lives. They want to feed the flock. There are men that don't care about your growth because they have no growth for themselves. It's a money grab. They look like, talk like, dress like the world. They are dishonorable garbage buckets. They need not to be in public. They need to keep their garbage with them. Your foundation is essential. I'm trying to emphasize people you listen to. What We all need help. That's what pastors are for. He helps dissect your word. Your foundation is essential. I know this ain't the most fiery message, but your foundation is essential. Leads to the next point, your foundation. So Paul, he just said it likens it to a great house. For those that claim the faith, point number two is Psalm 103, 14. For he knoweth our frame. He remembers that we are just dust. Not only does he remember, but he knows. He knows where we came from. He knows where we're going. Yeah. He knows that our natural frame is weak and unstable. Our ability and our capability without him leads to a life of misery, miserable and unfulfillment. We can easily be persuaded and we're very gullible. So we need a foundation for our frame. It's necessity that your foundation is solid before you start building your frame. It is necessity that your foundation is properly aligned. Every foundation starts with one block. It's the cornerstone. You must ensure that block is exactly where you want it. It's going to be how the rest of the foundation comes together. 
And the Bible says, and we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And I like this, in whom of all the building fitly framed together groweth a, t a holy temple in the Lord. That block, that cornerstone shapes the foundation, shapes the building. Peter exhorted us to grow in the grace of God. Building on the wrong, t on the wrong teaching, it will stump your growth. It will, um, it, it will, it will, it, it, you're not going to flourish how you should. So in our, back in our text 19, having this seal, that seal refers to that foundation and identifies the cornerstone. Tells people that's where the cornerstone is. That's where it is. Same as us. The moment you were saved, born again, you were given the Holy Spirit, sealed into the day of redemption. Easily identifiable. Having a weak foundation makes your, your framing worthless. Having a solid foundation and a weak framing causes constant setbacks until you can get it right. Having spirit and no truth is a setback. Having truth but no spirit is worthless. Jesus said God is a spirit. Those that worship must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hard to find churches with both. It's hard to find churches that, uh, let alone Christians, that have both. God has given us exactly what we need in order to sufficiently serve him and live a spiritually healthy and rewarding Christian life. We're such a small, insignificant, rebellious piece of dirt. Nothing more than dust. Yet according to the psalm, he forgiveth. He healeth, he redeemeth, he crowneth, and he satisfieth. Yeah. Because to the Lord, we're a special dust. Yeah. We're a type of dust that God Almighty, he made a huff and a puff and made this clump of dirt a living, breathing soul. And in that process, he instilled his image and his likeness into that dirt. It says, and the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his, nost breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul, gave you purpose, yeah. gave you life. Just breathing right now is an act of mercy from God. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. We have sadly forgotten of the mercy that God has given us. Psalm 103, it's an entire psalm on Thanksgiving. Many of God's children live in disobedience because you refuse to be thankful for what you have. That's not an option. That's a commandment to be thankful for what you have. Genesis 3.19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. With the disobedience of Adam, where God had literally put him in the garden with everything he needed, everything to suffice himself, the sin gave way to many curses, many curses that we, we still have even after the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us and renewed us. One of us is we have to work. We have to work for what we have, and it's a manner that's harsh, a manner that is displeasing to ourselves. We strive our whole life to work to retire. We work so we can eventually rest. But just the reality of work, uh, of life is having to work. You make it what you want, but work is not fun. Especially to me, work is not fun. There's not a single person in here that has felt so burnt out you feel like throwing the towel. Routine and repetitive takes its toll. And I'm telling you, I'm speaking from, exist from experience. That it takes its toll on you. It's a curse of the flesh that you have to bear. It's a curse that the devil will take full advantage of and get you distracted from God, get you distracted from your family, get you distracted from your church, and get you all up in your feelings feeling sorry for yourself. The devil will plant seeds of backslide, of drugs, of alcohol, quick fixes, temporary fixes. So we, we get tired, we get wore out, we get stressed, we get anxious, it gets difficult. Physically, we look good. Inside, we are beat down. And it's not to be a Debbie Downer. That's our frame. That's who we are naturally. We're weak. But he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. There's times we actually feel like this dust. But remember that he knoweth. And he allows it. Remember that the potter knows the clay. There's nothing that is happening to you that has not happened to somebody else. The Bible says, be sober. Be vigilant. You can't let your guard down when times like that happens. Because your adversary, the devil, as a warring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Listen. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. This is where that foundation of faith comes in. And it's where it is so important. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There have no temptation taken you, but that is common to man. But if God is faithful, he will not suffer you to be tempted above what ye are able but with that temptation, also make a way to escape it that you may be able to bear it. Oh, yeah. What's the way of escape? Too much weight on a frame can crush it. But the scripture just said with that temptation, with that trial, the test, there's got to be a way out. 
The way out is your word of is the word of God. Yeah. Is reading your word. What's the first thing when you feel sad about yourself? Yeah. It's a distraction. Yeah. Yeah. It's a quick entertainment fix. Yeah. Not your not your, not the word of God. That's where you've got to run when, when you're feeling down. That's your that's that's your you've you've got to withhold to the, the foundation. Keep to the foundation. That's the that's the, the, the two the two foundations. One on one on rain, one on sand. The, that the one on uh, rock is Lord Jesus Christ. The one on sand is opinion, uh, a changing opinion. It's what you hear. It's what you don't hear. Run to the Word of God, not the changing opinion. Study the Word. That's how you escape it. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You can live. You can feel like that dust, but He's got the whole world in His hands. Next point real quick. A weak foundation, a weak frame. And I mean those that are willingly weak. We're, we're Physically we get down, mentally we deteriorate, it happens. He knows your folly. Folly is a lack of good sense. It's foolishness. It's a, it's a foolish act, idea or a practice. He knows when you're trying and he knows when you're not. So what do I mean by folly? He knows your secrets. Psalm 44, 21 says, For he knoweth. The secrets of the heart. Secrets, they're essentially, they're bottled up, unrepentant disobedience. To be blunt, hypocrites that are living a secret life. We all come short. Confession is a privilege with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing that he don't already know. In Romans 2, 16, it says, the Bible, the Bible says, In that day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. There are those that are openly wicked. They flaunt it and they don't care. There are those who are morally right, but they're not saved. They're a good person. They're just as bad. That sounds just like a bunch of Republicans and Democrats. You've got, this is the thing too, you've got to distinguish your patriotism and your faith. I love Donald Trump just as much as the next guy, but he's not going to save you. He's not going to save this nation. It, it, we're in for a world of hurt. It's only going to wax worse. I tell people all the time, it's got to get worse for Jesus to come back. It has to get worse. You've got to distinguish the two. Because to be honest, Trump don't carry himself as a Christian. He claims it, curses when he's up there, the stuff he said. I'm not, bad, I'm not badgering him. Uh, Biden is pro-choice. I'll hit on. You got to distinguish it. They're, they're, they're lost men and in in, in lost men running the country. That's the problem with us. So there's ones that claim Christ. They're in the church. They preach. They preach against these two. They condemn their actions. They say they're ungodly. They say they're shameful. Yet they are just as unrighteous. They are just as wrong. They are not lined up with God themselves. All three have a record in heaven. They all three have a record to show on judgment. We all know what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is someone who merely just plays a part. They pretend to be someone and something that they're not. They pass judgment when they need to be pointing the finger right back at them. Remember, we can judge and we can discern right and wrong. You clearly know the open and wicked. You know the ones that are lost, that don't want to hear about God. They're good people. They'll listen to your witness. But those hypocrites can be so deceptive. They put themselves in the place of God. What do you mean by that? Everyone else is wrong in their mind. They're doing what's okay. They're, they're okay because they're doing something in the church. They put a Bible verse on Facebook. They wear a t-shirt. Uh, they, they listen to Christian music. Yet they still are not living fully righteously as they can. Our pulpit is filled with these men today. We've got too many doctors behind the pulpit and too many sick congregations. Everybody's a doctor anymore that comes behind a pulpit. God's judgment of the hypocrite will be based in the truth. There's that truth again. The truth, the foundation, the faith of what they are. Just as surely as his condemnation are to those who are openly wicked will be based in the truth of who they are. No difference. Never forget that God looks on the inside. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself that said sin begins with the heart. See, the prodigal son was openly rebellious. But his brother, I know he hated sin. He, he's, he's stuck with the father. But he was just as bad as the prodigal. He, he, he had hate. He had disdain. And he had jealousy in his heart with his brother when he should have opened him back with, with open arms. The hypocrite enjoys the good life. God withholds his immediate deserved judgment and the hypocrite thinks that the goodness of God is an indication of the favor of God. Truth is, God is merely more mercy 
giving that hypocrite every opportunity to repent. Every hypocrite feels that because they aren't guilty, at least outwardly, of their sins and of other men, that God must be pleased with them. Nothing could be further, far from the truth. Because the hypocrite misunderstands the blessings of God, he refuses to repent. One sin leads to the next, it leads to a harness. It is the goodness of God that we got saved and we, the, the love that we felt that allows us to witness, that allows us to want to help others have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but not the hypocrite. They see the goodness of God as a stamp of approval on their conduct. They thereby, they despise the blessings of God. That's a scary thing to be playing theater with a holy, righteous, living, jealous God. Scripturally, it says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them that do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy harness and impotent heart treasures up thyself wrath against the day of, uh, day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So instead of gaining favor, uh, you're living hypocritically. You're not laying up a reward. You're laying up wrath. Hell will be full of hypocrites as well as blatant sinners. They are a spit in the face of amazing grace. The hypocrite and the homosexual are the same exact on the inside. One's just outwardly about it. Same exact. When you get to judgment, God ain't going to care about anything else you're dead. Your judgment is going to be tailor fit just to you on how you live. You won't point the finger again. There'll be a day when judge, when God will judge all men. A day when all the secrets of men will be publicly proclaimed. A day when you will face the reality of what you really are. And I'm not pushing that down. I'm preaching it myself on this too. What's the basis of judgment? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. All that will matter in that day is what Jesus Christ, did you accept him or did you not? The basis of God's judgment is sin. Jesus handled the sin. Wrongdoings toward him, rebellion. You deserve hell. The Bible says the soul that sins shall die. So he knows your folly. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, Whatsoever ye, whatever that's spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. Yeah. It's the final point conclusion. He knows your future. Yeah. Heaven or hell. It's a, it's a beautiful, it's a humbling, overwhelming feeling to know how much Jesus loves you. Taking our place, he gives us a new hope, a new joy, yeah. new song in our heart. He pulled us out of the muck. He pulled us out of the mire. Put us on a solid rock until we get home. I promise when I say that this life and this world can be absolutely Awful. The lost people, there are reprobates that don't care about you. They will beat you down. They will tear you down. But it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. We're not all promised tomorrow morning. For the saved born again, no matter if we die physically or if I got to wake up and walk into hell tomorrow and go to work, there's joy for us. I'm still going to heaven. My name is still written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If not, you could literally wake up in a devil's hell that was not prepared for you. You're not made for that place. You're not made to carry burdens. You're not made to carry uh, these temptations and trials. That's, it, it's just, we didn't ask for it. You've got to deal with it. You've got to handle it. But I pray that you're part of the judgment seat of Christ, not the white throne judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is for the saints. It doesn't determine your salvation. It just determines how much heaven you're going to get. It's going to determine your reward after tribulation, after Armageddon, after the millennial reign. If you don't understand that, all this is going to be gone one day. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. This is going to be completely gone one day. It's forever. Revelation 20 says, Whosoever is not found and written in the, in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's important that God knows your name. It's contradictive. Of course, God knows everything. But I mean this from your own perspective. Know that you know that your name is written in heaven. I sincerely hope that you know God has made it so simple for you. You yeah. believe or you don't. You yeah. read or you don't. You obey or you don't. You come to church or you don't. It's that simple. I know there's a fight against the flesh, but you have power over that flesh. You have power over that. He knows my name. He knows I'm one of his. He knows I'm going to heaven. Brother Mark, uh, Brother uh, Bob, you want to help? Be not de deceived. That was the whole. Uh, I pray that it, it made sense. There is so much. There's churches popping up everywhere you see. 
the mega church is, is growing, the prosperity church is growing, and it's contradictive to the Bible. Contradictive teaching leads to false professions, leads to hell. The Bible says that hell enlarges herself daily. Stop relying on others' word, others' guidance. Paul said, we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro every which wind of doctrine. It's okay to read it by, by yourself. I promise it ain't going to hurt you. Eventually, you'll be able to understand it. You've got to be saved to understand it. We've got pastors that can help. There's, there's Bible study here. Uh, there's people that, there's your commitment. We have Bible study, yet you complain that you don't know the Bible, you don't understand the Bible. There's no, there's no effort on Bible study. There's no effort on nothing. There has to be an effort on your part. You personally were part of God's plan of salvation. You need a foundation. He knows your framing. I thank God that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, no matter how hard life gets. Father, Jesus, we love you. Father, we thank you that we're allowed to be written in your book. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for saving us. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, that there's coming a time where there'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more backbiting, tail bearing. Lord, that we can just live in perfect harmony and peace. God, look forward to a day where no more wrath or strife or babblings or vain babblings. Lord, we look forward to when the sun shall light the sky. Father, we I pray, dear Lord, if there's one here that don't know that their name is written down. Lord, that it's okay to put their pride aside and hit an altar and ask to, and ask to be saved. It's okay to be wrong. I'm wrong all the time, Lord. But I thank you for your word that's always right. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.